What we're also seeing is a very big shift in demographics. Today, the fastest growing segment of society in Europe are the over 80s. If you're under 50 today, there's an 83% chance that you'll live to 100. The expectation for my children is that they'll live to an average age of 120. Last year, some of you heard from a geneticist, but if you look at some of the work going on in proteomics, the, the building box of the human gene, one of the things that the scientists have discovered is a protein that can, controls the aging process. They believe that if you can switch off the functioning of that protein, we will extend human lifespans, or could extend human lifespans, by three to five times. Just imagine the challenges that creates. You know, what do you buy your partner for their 185th birthday? <laughs> Worse still, imagine the concept of saying I do. Now when you're saying I do, we're talking about saying yes, I'm going to be married to you for the next 180 years. <laughs> How many of us would still say yes, yeah, straight off? <laughs> and for those of us in, you know, who come from a world of arranged marriages, just imagine the trade-off we now make with our parents if we're going to say yes. Uh, and, and this is you know, really going to fundamentally affect our world in terms of where wealth is and how decisions get made and the imbalance that we're going to see between the very young countries like India you know, and, and the countries of Africa and the Middle East and, and South America and the ageing European economy and in terms of where energy is going to be and the balance of that and also where wealth is going to be. If we look at the economies of China and India, a lot of the wealth is with very young people. If you look at U the UK and the US, 75% of all the wealth in the US and the UK sits in the hands of people over the age of 65. Today, over 450 million people in China have a mobile phone. That's great, except less than 450 million people have fixed line electricity. So, one's sitting there thinking, well, how do you charge your phone? Enter Chaliyuan. Uh, these guys have developed a mobile phone charger that you can find on the street in hotels, in restaurants, and all sorts of locations where you plug your phone in and in 10 minutes you fully charge your phone. It costs you about 10 cents to do that. What's interesting is this company's already reinvented its business model three times because it's growing so fast. In the latest version of the business model, they give the charger to whoever hosts it and they take no revenue from them. The host takes all the revenue. These guys make all their money from a TV screen on the front of the charger. Why? Because we know if you've plugged your phone in, you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> you're going to stay with your phone. So now we have TV ads playing to you for 10 minutes. And they make all their money out of the advertising on that. Their next stage of development that looks likely is that they'll let the adverts be free as well. And they'll take a share of the revenues that the advertisers generate because there'll be a token come up. There'll be like a code come up for the purchasers. So the purchaser then goes and uses that code to make a purchase. So you can track who's purchased and they'll just take a turn on the revenues. So an entire free delivery system. And that's one of the big trends that I think we're going to see more and more in the world. It's something that was added value today, becoming a free service tomorrow. Uh, if we look at how we're going to travel, then we know that very soon um, the, the Airbus A380 is going to come into service. This is a plane that can seat up to 800 people. Uh, some of you may have seen the stuff in the press where Airbus are talking about the idea of actually being able to stand throughout the flight. <laughs> yeah? So we could see you know, something like 1,200 people. But this is a plane big enough, you know, with three stories, where rather than flying to a conference, you could have your conference on the plane and just party when you get there. <laughs> you know, this could change all sorts of concepts about how we travel, where we travel. But the interesting thing is that whereas governments like Dubai and Singapore have had the foresight to adapt their runways and their airports to cater to this, to give themselves the option to handle it. Most airports in the world are still arguing about whether they should have a feasibility study. You know, what's that going to do? What's that going to do in terms of where the routes are going to go and where the hubs are naturally going to you know, end up happening? But if we look beyond that, um, one of the things, again, um, Dubai got very excited about was the idea of hypersonic travel. Uh, when hypersonic comes in, which is the kind of um, successor to supersonic, we'll be able to do the flight from London to Dubai in just over an hour. How will that change our world? How will that change our concept of where we can travel to for a weekend break if we can get there in an hour? How will that change the concept of business meetings? 
mean, the guys from South Africa, from De Beers, could fly to London for a business meeting, stop off in Dubai on the way home, and still be ho back in, home in time to put the kids to bed. You know, fundamentally changing the way in which we conceive how we do business, the way our lives are constructed, what's going to happen.